So we're in this series, I think this is our third week um, on this Subvert series. And this series is all about this upside down kingdom that we find ourselves in when we begin to follow Jesus and become his disciples. It's a way of living and being that is not only greatly countercultural, but it's a type of faith that actually disrupts kind of the established patterns of this world. And not only that, it disrupts us from following those patterns of the world and causes us as Christians to live differently than that, to live according to the kingdom. It is subversive. That's what we have here, the big SAT word, you know, meaning that it undermines or it takes the power away from all those pulls, all those draws of temptation and mindsets and attitudes of what Paul calls this present evil age. Okay, it causes us to think, it's a faith that we think differently, we act differently, and we can resist those things. And so this morning, what I want to look at is we're going to talk about what I'm going to call kind of this temporal value of self-preservation versus what I think is its kingdom counterpart of self-sacrifice. And whether or not, you know, there's this aphorism of safety first, you know, how, how relevant is that when we're talking about the kingdom of God? Where does that fit and where does that play uh, when we're talking about God's kingdom? So I have a, a brother, a younger brother. Uh, I can't call him my little brother because he's about this much taller than me. But a younger brother that works in the risk management world. And he is making very, very, very good money <laughs> doing it. Um, there is this entire risk management market. Okay. Uh, in 2022, the risk management market worldwide was valued at about $12.6 billion dollars. By 2032, it is expected to reach $52 billion. Anybody who does investments, that's a good, inv you know, that's, that's, that's where you put your money, right? In these markets, it is growing very quickly. And here's this entire industry that seeks to do all it can to minimize or even eliminate danger or threats to all aspects of our lives, really. Uh, you know, you name it, right? Physical safety, financial security, privacy, operational concerns, health concerns, governmental, organizational concerns, whatever, legal, whatever it might be, right? Whatever industry you're in, there's a risk management person to tell you how to keep that as safe as possible, right? And so it is an industry that is completely funded by the prioritizing of self-preservation, right? And it's doing really well. <laughs> right? This need for safety, this need for security, this need to lower risk and danger, and there's plenty for it to feed off of. And yet, in our scripture, we have verses like these. Sorry, whoever's running words, you're going to have to jump through it with me real quick. Um, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. It's from John 15, 13. Uh, from Luke 14, 33, these first two are, are Jesus. Then, So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. From Matthew, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And then lastly, this, this chunk from Philippians came up in pre-service prayer this morning. I had to smile when it did. But whatever things, this is Paul now, were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish so that I might gain Christ. These verses, none of them are very good risk management, are they? And they're not very good self-preservation strategy either. Because really neither one of those things are kingdom values in that way. Even in our own denomination, we have this expression. If you've been here very long, you'll probably recognize it. This is one of our distinctives, and it's called faith is spelled, all together now, 
R-I-S-K. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K, risk. That's right. So I want to read you an excerpt. This is from a Vineyard small group study that kind of is explaining this value and what we mean by this. There is something about Jesus's faith, something about the faith of the disciples that is deeper, wider, stronger, and more faith with skin on than mere belief. It's called conviction. Conviction is it has been said, is faith on fire. Conviction ignites faith to become real life, risk it all, buy the field to find the treasure action. When we have a conviction about something, not only have we agreed with the belief in our hearts and minds, we are also backing up that belief with our entire body. We take action. We walk into difficult and unknown situations, and we do things we never thought we would do. Conviction has the power to motivate us to go beyond our fears, enabling even the most timid person to throw caution to the wind as they act on what they believe. Conviction means that a belief has soaked deep into our bones, and now our entire body, and I would say our entire lives, our entire existence, is involved in acting out that belief. And that's what we mean when we talk about this, that faith is spelled R-I-S-K, that our faith has to go into and look like us risking for things and trying things and following after God regardless of what that looks like. So there's an organization that used to be called Asian Access. It's now called A2, and it is a Christian missions agency in South Asia. And a number of years ago, some of you may have seen this a while back when it first came out, if you kind of are in those circles on social media, you follow Christianity Today or those kind of things. But a number of years ago, they put out this list of questions that some of their church planters in one of their particular countries, and they didn't list the country because, again, you know, safety is good when you can mitigate dangers and things, you know, reasonably um, and still follow the Lord and especially keeping your church planters and things safe. Um, But they put out this list of questions that a lot of their church planters in this particular country that happened to be a Hindu country were asking new believers, new followers of Jesus who wanted to be baptized, okay? And this is a country where Christianity was growing very quickly, especially among the poor and among the tribal parts of the country, but there was still very strong persecution for those who did convert and begin to follow Jesus. So here's these questions. Check these out. Number one, are you willing to leave home and lose the blessing of your father? And this was a country where that, that parental blessing was a very big deal, right? You, you probably have read some of that in the Bible, right? You, you bless your sons, this blessing, remember the Cain and Abel blessing kind of thing, um, is really important. And it was in this country. Number two, are you willing to lose your job? Because it's not a place where, you know, all faiths and beliefs were protected, right? You could lose your job for believing something different. Are you willing to go to the village and those who persecute you, forgive them and share the love of Christ with them? Well, hang on. Those first two might've been a little easier. Now they didn't require as much risk, but now we're kind of getting, you know, tooth and nail here. Are you willing to give an offering to the Lord? Remember, Christianity was growing among the very poor, right? This was a sacrificial thing. Are you willing to be beaten rather than deny your faith. Things just got real, real. Are you willing to go to prison? Are you willing to die for Jesus? Well, that escalated kind of quickly, didn't it? How do you think it would go on our next baptism Sunday? (laughs) If we took the, you know, we get up here and we ask the people who are getting in the trough ready to be baptized, you know, we ask them a number of questions that have to do with their belief and their agreement with a certain, you know, belief in who Jesus is. What if we use these instead? How do you think that would change the tone? How do you think that would change how many people wanted to get baptized? You know, with those of you who were baptized in the past couple of months, we've had two different rounds of baptism in the, kind of recently here. You know, would, would these questions have given you a little bit more pause before you got in the water? Good. Adam says no. Awesome. You're on it. I don't know if that'd be true for everyone because these are, these are heavy, right? This really shows that faith and risk and action. You know, if anyone has ever said to you, and I don't know if this is a case for you, it is for me, but if anyone has ever said to you something to the effect of, you are never safer than when you were in the center of God's will, 
Any of you ever heard that? No, not really? Uh, okay, yeah, I see some nods. You're never safer than when you're in the center of God's will. They might have unknowingly misled you. Because I'm just not sure that's the case. It reminds me of that quote, from the Chronicles of Narnia, where Susan meets Mr. Beaver. You guys are you Chronicles of Narnia fans. You remember this, right? And he's telling her about Aslan, the lion. Aslan is who the Christ figure is in that series of movies. And, and Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I'm not going to bust out my British accent for you all. <laughs> I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And Mr. Beaver says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I love that line. I, I love that whole story. It's what it reminds me of. Because God's will can actually be a pretty dangerous place. You know, you think about the examples in the Bible, right? John the Baptist was beheaded for it. Jesus, our example, our Savior, he was crucified for it. Stephen was stoned. Most of the 12 disciples ended up martyred in some way that we know of. And Paul says of himself this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A, day, a night and a day I have spent adrift at sea. I have been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst often without food, in cold and exposure. And Paul, too, likely, as far as we know, was martyred. Would we argue that any of those people were outside of God's will, though? God's will can be a pretty dangerous place. So those are biblical examples, obviously, from thousands of years ago. This one almost brings me to tears. Have any of you seen this, guy, this next story? You guys seen this pop up? in the last week and a half or so on social media. This is Davy and Natalie Lloyd. They were a newlywed couple that went almost right away to Haiti to serve Jesus at an orphanage there at, at his father's. Um, his father kind of ran that mission, and they went to serve there. And that area of Haiti, the Port-au-Prince area, if you've been following the news, is a very dangerous place to be right now. It has been completely taken over by gangs, the airport, just everything. Gangs are, are ruling and, and running everything. And the, you know, they, they asked them if they wanted to evacuate, and they said, no, we're staying. There's a second picture with the children in the orphanage. They said, no, we're going to stay. We're going to care for these children. We believe this is what the Lord has called us to do. And so they stayed. And 10 days ago, they were murdered by one of these gangs, serving the Lord, feeling what they believed, you know, doing what they believed he had called them to do, and they lost their lives for it. And after they were shot and killed, the, the gangs set the building that they were in on fire, and last I heard, they were still trying to go and recover them and bring them home for services and funeral and everything. It, it's hard, right? These kids are kind of left and scattered. They're trying to figure out how to how to help this orphanage. But, you know, as Jesus sends out his 12, one of the main things he tells them is this. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I, I forgot to grab it, but I was going to bring with, with me this morning our um, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Any of you familiar with that book? Um, it's not a skinny one. <laughs> it's a pretty big book, and it's a book of just uh, thousands of people that have given their lives in service of the king, living for Jesus. And they were people who took Jesus' words very seriously. They counted everything lost for the sake of following Christ and gave their lives for it, even to the point of death. Because, yes, I am tired. <laughs> I am. How did you know? I think that was God telling me to take a nap, take a nap after service. <sighs> you 
gotta love church, don't you? It's so weird. So I want you to hear this. God's risk analysis church has an eternal perspective to it. It is not bounded by this life or your current circumstances or wanting to retire at a certain age or wanting to avoid discomfort or awkwardness or whatever other parameters that we might put on it. The kingdom's concern when it comes to harm is one with an eternal and spiritual perspective to it. Not just a material one, not just an earthly one, not just a physical one. And what an absolutely incredible countercultural thing for us as Christians to say that even if they can kill us, they cannot harm us. Wait, what? That is absolutely dumbfounding to the world's way of understanding and valuing security. Do you follow me there? What an upside down subversive way of thinking and being and living. Now, please understand, you know, none of this is to promote anybody running out and being reckless and just throwing yourselves at every dangerous situation because, you know, you believe that that's somehow more holy or more spiritual or more pleasing to God because it's not. Like, that's just silly. It's not wise. And the Bible tells us to be wise and to count the cost of our discipleship. But it is to say that pleasing God, following Jesus, is inevitably going to lead us into dangerous, costly, sacrificial circumstances and situations where our physical safety or our financial security or any of those things are going to be at risk. It's going to happen eventually. Maybe not to the extent of some of these examples, but it's going to happen. So let's go to our main scripture for today. Now is the time to pull out your apps or your Bibles, and we're going to read a pretty, pretty good chunk here. We're going to go and start in Acts chapter 20. If you want to be finding that, Paul here is on his third missionary journey. He is trying to reach Jerusalem before Pentecost, and so he's in a hurry. And being in a hurry, he realizes that he is not going to have time to go and visit the church in Ephesus again. And so he gets to a certain town and kind of calls some of the leaders from the Ephesian church um, to him to tell them, you know, what's happening and that he's not going to be able to come back and see them anymore. And so he is spending time with them. And that's where we pick up in these verses that we're going to start with here. Um, Y'all, I am getting to the point. I I need readers. Like I have hit that age. I see, man, I brought the wrong Bible with a small print. Okay. Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 22. And now compelled by the spirit And this is Paul telling these leaders of the Ephesian church this. And now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. So he spends a bit more time with these guys, telling them by, you know, there's a whole lot of hugging and tears and, and encouragement and all these things, tells them by, and then they set sail again. Remember, Luke is, is with him. He's the one writing this account, writing this book. And they make a couple of more stops, and then they land in Caesarea. And we're going to jump over to the next chapter, chapter 21, and we're going to start in verse 8 and read verses 8 through 18. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, The Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, this being Luke speaking, when we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Because that's the logical response, right? This guy who's a known, reliable, trusted prophet is telling you, if you go, this is going to happen. And in our minds, we say, therefore, don't go. But that's not what Paul says. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, 
but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Nason, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. And so Paul has heard this prophecy, but continued on. And so now they're in Jerusalem. They've made it there. Uh, They are having a conversation with James and the other elders in Jerusalem. And Paul goes through a time of purification with some of the leaders there. It was a week, like shaving his head, a week um, of purification, this ritual. And he's in the temple. And then drop down to verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, meaning the seven days of this purification ritual that he was doing, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law in this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus with the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Well, that was nice of them to wait for a minute. (laughs) The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Sound familiar? Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, away with him. So the soldiers safely get Paul out of this terrible situation where he's literally an attempt made on his life. He's being beaten. He's being, um, trying, trying to be killed by, by the Jews. And the commander gets him out with his soldiers. And then Paul actually turns on and asks the commander, he said, hang on, can I speak to the crowd for a minute? That's, that's yelling at me. And the commander actually allows it. And Paul goes on to give his entire testimony about how he used to persecute and killed Christians, but how Jesus showed up to him on the road, and now he is totally changed, and he is a follower of Jesus, and that the Spirit has now sent him to preach to the Gentiles, but they didn't really like that part. Go over to chapter 22, because everything in between here is, is Paul giving his testimony. Go back during the re- week and read all this. Like, it's such a saga. It's just crazy all that Paul went through, and this is just part of it, right? So go over to chapter 22. And we're going to start in verse 22, and we're going to read a little bit into chapter 23. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. That means until he said the part about being sent to preach to the Gentiles, because that really upset the Jews. Like they had had enough at this point. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, Uh, Very dramatic, right? Very upset. The commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Ooh, mic drop, Paul. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. Now, if you need to understand, Roman citizens had great protection. That It was a very thorough due process. They had rights that should not be violated. And when he said this, this triggered a certain series of events for uh, protection of Roman citizens that Paul was entitled to. 
The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, he am. Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. So the next day, excuse me, the next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there, yeah, he's, oops. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, you dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Now listen to this, and then we're going to end with the scripture here. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify about me in Rome. Paul's like, wow, that wasn't enough. You know, I can imagine that's how I would feel. It's like, yeah, all that that you just did, you got to go do that in Rome too. You did what I wanted in Jerusalem. Now you're going to, I'm going to send you to, in Rome. And so Paul's saga continues. Excuse me. All the way through until the end of the book of Acts. It's, it's him being imprisoned for two years. Let me set this down. He goes through all sorts of stuff. He is eventually sent to Rome, but in the process, um, and he's sent to Rome, by the way, uh, the way he ends up there is he appealed to Caesar as a Roman citizen. He wanted Caesar to hear his case um, and judge on it. And as a Roman citizen, he had the right to do that. You couldn't do anything with him until they were able to do that. Well, Caesar was a busy guy. <laughs> and so sometimes it took a long time to be seen. And so uh, he's in prison for two years. He's sent to Rome, takes quite a while to get there. And all the whole time, these Jews are still trying to get to him, still trying to kill him. But the whole time, Paul is still sharing his testimony and he's still preaching the gospel of the kingdom throughout it all, no matter what happens to him. And so through all sorts of loss and trials, he was shipwrecked shipwrecked. He was bitten by a poisonous viper. Um, he remains a faithful minister of the gospel. I would say in God's will, right? Doing what the Lord asked him to do. And in all of this danger and hardship and all of this risk and discomfort, he did not give up. He remained faithful. All right. So remember the guy Agabus back in chapter 21, the guy who came to Paul, who was the prophet and took Paul's belt off of him and wrapped his own hands and feet with it, right? So this, this was a very prophetic act, right? Telling Paul that if you go to Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to be arrested. It's not going to be good. Now, what I need you to understand is that it's not that Paul thought that Agabus was wrong, right? He believed the prophecy. He believed the prophet. He believed the guy speaking for the Lord. He was a, a trusted, tried, faithful guy. So it's not that Paul thought the prophecy was off or wrong and chose to ignore it. But what did Paul say after that? He said, I am ready 
not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And, you know, we need to understand, it's not that Paul was some sort of like adrenaline junkie who was just constantly out there trying to do unsafe, dangerous things, um, you know, it, in his, or means or method or anything like that. Paul did pray for safety. Like, especially in Romans, he prayed for safety, and he asked others to pray for him and his provision and his safety. It's not like he wanted to go through this stuff. But even having been warned about what would happen to him and knowing that it was true, Paul had a willingness to suffer for the gospel of Christ. And he prioritized that sacrifice over self-preservation out of obedience to the Lord and a desire to please his father, to please Jesus. He wasn't overly safety conscious. You know, he didn't allow some sort of like fear-based poverty mentality type of narrative to dictate his choices to make him run when he heard that prophecy. He was emboldened and empowered by the Spirit of God in the face of danger, in the face of persecution and trials and loss and attack and hunger to take up his cross and follow Jesus, no matter what it meant. All right, so just kind of a real quick aside here. You know, there's the question of, well, you're saying that God's will can be a pretty dangerous place. What about all those verses that talk about God keeping us safe and God protecting us and those sorts of things? Um, I want to just hit this really quick because I want you to know I'm not ignoring those. You know, I'm not glossing over them. I think it's important that we understand what's going on here. So let, let's talk about him for just a moment. Um, in preparation for this sermon, I went back and read not all, but dozens of those types of verses, you know, talking about God's provision and protection and safety and those sorts of things. And most of them focus on one of three things. And those three things are listed here. The first one is the fact that when we are in trouble or we are in danger, when you're in hardship, that God will be with us is the promise that it gives. Not necessarily that God will remove us from the trouble or the trouble from us or the danger from us, but that in the midst of it, he will be with us. This is, again, one of the things that came up in pre-service prayer this morning, these storms and these trials and the Lord being with us through them, that he won't necessarily remove us. The second thing a lot of these verses focus on is this question of what can flesh or what can man do to me? Well, they can do a lot to you can't they? They can hurt you pretty good. (laughs) They can take your life. Man can do a lot of bad things. But the point is that when Jesus said this to to his disciples, you know, what what can man do to you? What, what, What can flesh do to you? It's pointing out, rather than a physical security, a spiritual security, an eternal perspective, that even when our physical selves can be harmed, we are protected in an eternal spiritual way that even if you lose your life, God still has you. We get to go be with him, right? And third is the promise to protect us from evil or the evil one. Again, we're looking at a spiritual perspective here, right? He's not promising to protect us from being battered and bruised, but from evil, which again is a a spiritual thing that attacks our soul, our nature, right? Not necessarily our physical selves. So all that, but also I want to mention context matters. A lot of these verses you're going to find in the Old Testament. um, And that's when the, the Lord was establishing a physical kingdom on this earth through the nation of Israel, right? He had the promised land set aside for them. He's sending a group of people into this promised land to own it, to occupy it, to, to, be his people, his nation, his physical kingdom in the world. And so national safety and security during that time was a whole different level because it, it mattered to get God's kingdom, his physical kingdom established in the promised land. And so a lot of these promises that he makes to Israel are about that, that when he's, when he's establishing his physical kingdom, the promises are not universal to us in that way. There is something called a covenant context at work here, that this is the old covenant and he is promising his people a certain thing for that time and that place. And we, you know, 
we make a mistake when we read the Bible that way. You know that? Like we need to know who God's talking to and what the context is and what he's doing in that time. So what he promised to Abraham or to Moses or to Joshua, etc., was in the context of what he was doing to form the nation of Israel in this covenantal context. And you can't just pluck verses out of context and throw them down when you're having a rough day. Do you know what I mean? Now, that is not to say, obviously, that God does not protect us. He does not meet us. Um, I have had a number of times where the Lord has physically protected me um, from all sorts of things. And so I'm not saying he doesn't do that. I'm just saying we need to read the scripture with integrity, that we're not just plucking scriptures out and saying, well, God said, well, yeah, he said that, but who did he say it to and what was the context? So I wanted to just touch on that for a minute since we're talking about a really hard topic here of this self-preservation and security thing. So this next picture, um, we've got this, this wall hanging. If you've been to our house, you've probably seen this one hanging downstairs. It looks familiar. A neighbor of uh, ours gave this to me a number of years ago, and it hung it up. And it says, God doesn't promise days without rain, laughter without sorrow, nor sun without rain. But he did promise strength for today, comfort for the tears, and light for the way. Now, that is a super Hallmark-esque way you know, and fun little pretty writing on the thing on the wall of saying these things, right? All this stuff that we've been talking about, that the promises of God and the promises that he makes, the protection that he offers is beyond physical comfort, physical safety, that he promises to guard us from evil in the spiritual battle. He promises to uphold us, to give us strength, to not to avoid hardship. He promises to provide for us, not necessarily what we want, but what he knows we need in that moment, right? Not everything we want. And our appropriate response to this, to his call, is to offer ourselves, as what does he say we are? To offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, to not go into self-preservation mode. Now, a lot of the examples that we have talked about this morning, obviously, they're pretty heavy. They've been the more extreme ones that involve serious physical harm or death or, or those sorts of things. And the reality is that most of us will probably never have to deal, thankfully, with that kind of sacrifice in our life, right? It's just not our reality, thankfully. We, most of us live in very safe areas. You know, we don't, we don't go to Port-au-Prince, Haiti um, when gangs are ruling it. You know, we're not preaching to Old Testament Jews who are super mad that we're speaking to Gentiles too and that sort of thing. Um, and thank, thank God for that, right? Like, I, I am so blessed that we live in a place that we can safely practice and live out our faith and worship. But I am sure that there are some of us who have said no to a call of God on our lives because it's too unpredictable, because we can't adequately assess the risk to our lifestyle or our comfort or our family or the plans that we've made, right? Some of you maybe have gone into a self-preservation mode with your finances. I don't talk about money much, but I think I'd be remiss not to here. Maybe you're not giving generously, or maybe you're not giving at all, because you have your plans, and you don't, you, you don't know how to mitigate the risk to your bank account if you give the way that the Lord is asking you to give or to be generous. And really, you know, how much sense does that spiritual math make, right? When God is our provider anyway of everything that we have and he's called us to live sacrificially. Some of you maybe have been unwilling to speak to a coworker or a neighbor about your faith or tell them about Jesus because it's uncomfortable and you don't want them to think badly of you or, of you or think you're a weird person or, you know, oh, they're, they're weak-minded if they have this faith and, faith and believe these things. You don't want backlash from any of those. So I'm wrapping up here, and I just want to ask you to consider in this moment whether you are trusting your own plans and your own wisdom are you building a structure around yourself for self-preservation? Or are you truthfully asking God what it is that he requires and asks of you? 